The patients um, with hepatitis B frequently come to the clinic and say, what about a cure for me? So before we talk about the possibilities of a cure, let's just um, review what we currently can do for hepatitis B. Uh, we do have very good drugs uh, that are effective in suppressing the virus. Uh, and certainly by suppressing the virus, we reverse not only inflammation, but also fibrosis. And we do prevent progression to cirrhosis and liver failure and decrease the risk of liver cancer. Um, and they're very, very safe. However, these drugs do not completely eradicate the virus. They certainly do not eradicate CCC DNA or integrate to HBV DNA. There's a very low rate of hepatitis B service antigen loss. And for the majority of the patients, they require very long durations of therapy. And the risk of XCC persists uh, even though it's at a much lower rate. So why is it so difficult to achieve hepatitis B cure? Um, we have to recognize that the biology of the virus is very different. Uh, we all are familiar with um, the presence of the CCC DNA, uh, which um, is refractory to currently available treatment. Um, they high in the uh, hepatocyte nucleus, and there is recycling of the virus so that um, there is constant replenishment. Uh, and the half-life of CCC DNA is very long. We know about the existence of um, integrated HPV DNA, which is um, not responsive to currently available therapy. And in patients with chronic hepatitis B, they also have impaired immune response. So when we talk about a cure for hepatitis B, is it really possible? And we have to really think of what happens in nature. What happens in nature is if you have a patient with transient acute hepatitis B with rapid S antigen to S antibody seroconversion, the virus is actually not completely gone. The virus still stays in the liver. And we know that because if we immunosuppress these patients, the virus can be reactivated. We also know that if we take the liver from these patients and transplant them to seronegative recipients and do not give them prophylactic antiviral, you can bring about transmission of hepatitis B. We also know that in patients who have recovered from hepatitis B, they still maintain a very vigorous immune response to hepatitis B decades after that transient infection. And that tells us that there must be traces of virus that constantly stimulate uh, the immune response. So is a cure for hepatitis B really possible? So in September 2016, ASLD and ESO, um, together with FDA and EMA and many people in this audience, uh, we worked together on an endpoint workshop knowing that um, we are all refocusing our attention to hepatitis B. And at this um, workshop, there were 200 plus um, people attended. And prior to the meeting, we sent our survey to people who registered. And we had about a third of the people who responded to the survey. And you can see that um, there is a mix of um, people from the industry as well as um, from ac academia. And we actually had a few people from the regulatory agencies responding to the survey as well. So one of the first questions that we ask is, well, how should a virological cure for hepatitis B be defined in clinical trials? And you can see the majority of the people actually do not believe that sterilizing cure is possible, but that a functional cure with outcomes similar to persons with chronic hepatitis B with spontaneous or antiviral-induced clearance of service antigen is what we should be shooting for. So we further ask, well, if that's what you choose, exactly how we define that. And every, pretty much everyone said, well, the serum HPV DNA should be undetectable, E antigen should be negative, and S antigen should be negative. But when you look at whether surface antibody is necessary, only about half of them. We all think that getting rid of CCC DNA is important, but only about half of them well, would think that um, we need to render the CCC DNA transcriptionally inactive. Part of the reason is um, perhaps because we know that in the short term, we probably are unable to achieve that goal. It's not that we don't want to get rid of the CCC DNA or the integrated HPV DNA, but we just are realistic that short term, we won't be able to get there. We further ask, when we're designing clinical trials, what should be the primary endpoint for both phase two as well as phase three clinical trials looking at novel antiviral therapy?
recognizing the phase two trials, usually small number of patients, short duration of therapy. So you're not gonna really be able to achieve everything that you want. Um, and mo majority of the people said it's done. Well, the most important thing is HPV DNA render undetectable. We also like to see a decline in surface antigen titer. But when it comes to phase three, we set a higher bar. Uh, a majority of the people rank um, clearing surface antigen as being the top priority. When it comes to at what time point do we assess the primary endpoint, phase two, again, recognizing short duration of therapy is six months on treatment, whereas with phase three is six months off treatment. We all know that with hepatitis B, when you suppress the virus and you stop the treatment, the virus oftentimes comes back. Um, and so unlike hepatitis C, uh, we would need to have a longer duration of follow-up for phase three to really be sure that we've achieved our goals. We further asked, what if we use immunomodulatory therapy? Would the endpoints be different? Well, phase two majority rank um, undetectable HBV DNA as number one priority. Um, and for um, phase three clinical trials, similarly, um, service antigen. Here we recognize that with immunomodulatory therapy, it may take a little longer uh, for us to see the results. And therefore, the majority would rank um, looking at endpoint uh, after stopping treatment uh, because immunomodulatory therapy and like um, direct active, acting antiviral, uh, you may not see an immediate effect. We recognize that we do, whether you use antiviral or immunomodulatory therapy, um, chances are we're gonna need a combination. Um, and when we develop a anti combination antiviral therapy, do we need to make sure that um, each of these agents on its own uh, achieve viral efficacy before we can combine, because otherwise it would take forever. Um, and we know that with HIV as well as with hepatitis C, we only need very minimal data before we can combine. Um, and we're very thankful to actually have FDA and EMA agree that safety is the most important thing to establish. And there must be also some indication about um, drug interactions um, before we combine them. Uh, we need to see some antiviral activity, but we do not need full-blown efficacy um, data before we can start combining the agents together. So with that in mind, we reach a consensus in terms of how we define hepatitis B cure. Uh, in the purest sense, we want a complete sterilizing cure as if that person has never been exposed to the hepatitis B virus, and we all recognize that that's impossible. Uh, we are currently at the stage where we get somewhat of a partial cure with um, oral antivirals. We suppress the virus, uh, except that um, right now uh, we have to maintain the patients on treatment. And we all believe that short term, if we can actually get a partial cure with a defined cause of therapy, and we take the patients off and the virus is still suppressed, that would be pretty good. But ultimately, we really want to get a functional cure. And here you can think of it in two sense. Uh, one is idealistic functional cure, similar to people with a transient acute hepatitis B infection, surface antigen to surface antibody serial conversion, and how does this um, differ from a realistic functional cure, which is like someone with chronic hepatitis B and surface antigen loss. I think largely that is dependent on the presence of residual liver damage because patients with chronic hepatitis B who have been carrying the virus for many years before we achieve S antigen loss, there'll be residual liver damage. The risk of HCC will be higher um, than people who recover from a transient acute hepatitis B infection. So we can think of cure both in terms of virologic sense as well as um, the liver sense. In the terms of virologic sense, um, initially we start um, with a lower bar, a partial cure, surface antigen still positive, but HPV DNA undetectable, CCC DNA and integrated um, HPV DNA still detectable. Uh, but if we achieve that, we'll have decreased necroinflammation, uh, and over time fibrosis may regress. But ultimately we want to get a functional cure where surface antigen is undetectable, DNA is undetectable, CCC DNA may still be there, but transcriptionally not as active. Integrated HPV DNA will still be there. And if we achieve that, not only do we get decrease in inflammation, but also regression of fibrosis and reduction in XCC risk. Um, it may be a long, long time from now before we can achieve sterilizing cure and completely restore the liver to normal. But I think that if we get the functional cure, and regression of fibrosis and reduction in cancer risk uh, in the next 10 years would be um, doing quite well. 
And we know that we can achieve all these because even with the current antiviral therapy, if we treat the patients long enough and the virus is suppressed for long enough, uh, we can get regression in fibrosis and cirrhosis. This is the tenofovir DF on phase three trial, um, baseline liver biopsy and year five liver biopsy, red and pink on the patients with cirrhosis. And you can see that in five years with suppression of virus, three quarters of the patients had regression of um, cirrhosis. We also know that um, yes, the first few years on antiviral therapy, the cancer risk appears to progressively increase at a linear rate. However, if you wait long enough, after five years, in the patients with cirrhosis who are at the greatest risk, you begin to see a flattening of the graph. Um, so we know that even with just suppressing HPV DNA replication, we can reduce the cancer risk. And if we can uh, clear surface antigen, then the um, prognosis is even better. So this is some data of um, patients who are not on treatment, but naturally um, follow. And you can see that um, if they get rid of only um, E antigen or DNA, um, the risk of um, cancer continues, but if they clear surface antigen as well, um, the risk is dramatically uh, reduced over time. And this is after adjustment uh, for age, gender, and ALT. So when it, um, people ask, is surface antigen loss really a good enough um, endpoint? I think that um, it is not perfect, uh, but um, it is definitely associated with improvement in clinical outcome. So the next question is, do we really need anti-service seroconversion? And this is some analyzing um, data from the Gillette database of 74 patients who lost service antigen either as a result of new therapy or with um, PAC interferon therapy. Um, the key is really whether the service antigen loss is confirmed on repeat testing um, after a six month um, period of time, uh, if you have confirmed S antigen loss, whether you have seroconversion to anti service or not, uh, is you get the same durability. On the other hand, there's some patients who lost S antigen once, and on repeating again, um, they would um, become service antigen positive. Um, and those are the patients in whom the durability obviously is lower. So it seems like service antibody seroconversion is not essential. It's good, but it's not um, important. So I think that um, settling on realistic functional cure, which is similar to chronic hepatitis B infection with S antigen loss, either spontaneously or all with current antiviral therapy, uh, is good enough. And um, this is in some ways very similar to Hep C patients with cirrhosis who achieve SVR. Um, the relapse rate is extremely low, um, and yes, um, the you know, liver cancer risk is still there, but over time, that risk continues to decline. Um, so let me just recapitulate um, with virological efficacy. Um, we would like um, if the patients achieve service antigen negative and HPV DNA undetectable, um, there is improvement in clinical outcome. But there are a number of questions that arise. Are the current assays for service antigen sufficiently sensitive? Um, how do we detect residual surface antigen in the immune complex? Because when we get rid of um, surface antigen, is it true that it's all gone, or is it combined uh, in the immune complex with anti-surface antibody? And I've addressed the question that seroconversion to anti-S may not be crucial. Um, and um, if we are doing clinical trials, particularly with um, phase two clinical trials, um, can we just follow S antigen loss, and can kinetics of S antigen decline predict who would get um, S antigen clearance, and right now we're not sure. And we've now also heard that, um, well, when surface antigen is still detectable, uh, is it um, because the CCC DNA is still there, or is the surface antigen being translated from integrated HPV DNA? These are all questions that we need to resolve. I've briefly touched upon the timing of assessment. Um, certainly in early um, clinical trials in phase two, we don't want to wait two years um, to determine. Um, so we have to look at on-treatment response, but ultimately uh, for phase three trials, we have to look at off-treatment response. Uh, and in terms of um, assessing clinical outcome, we'll have to wait for even longer term follow-up. Um, and as far as um, liver efficacy and PON, um, is a virologic endpoint sufficient for the patients in terms of um, improvement in clinical outcome. Some people said that, um, well, we now need to assess symptoms, patient report outcomes. But majority of the patients, particularly those without cirrhosis, don't have symptoms, so it's really difficult to um, put out uh, marks on the um, patient report outcomes. 
Uh, we would like to um, see improvement in liver enzymes, but nowadays with many people being obese, uh, if you suppress the virus but the ALT remains mildly elevated, is it because of the virus or is it because of fatty liver? Uh, so these are all things that we need to settle. We certainly are going away from doing repeat biopsies. Um, but it may be that in certain um, situations, we still need to do biopsies, particularly if we're looking at new therapies, um, to try to see if the proposed mode of mechanism of action is indeed the case. But increasingly, we're going to rely on non-invasive non assessment of liver fibrosis. Uh, and ultimately, we do want to show that um, treatment improves clinical outcome. But that should be in the post-approval registry um, phase. So with all these new treatments, we also need new diagnostic tests uh, in order to provide uh, mechanistic insights into effects of novel antiviral therapy. And many of the new assays that we've been talking about is, do we need better assays for service antigen, more sensitive, uh, maybe allow us to determine if um, um, they are present in immune complex, uh, maybe to differentiate whether these are small S or whether this is a um, um, large S or middle S. Um, there have been a lot of interest in looking at HPV RNA assays, particularly if they can detect circulating pregenomic RNA, because that may be a more direct measure of CCC DNA uh, instead of um, relying on liver tissue. There's also been an interest in hepatitis B correlated antigen as well. Um, certainly in um, the development um, phase, we're still interested in measuring and what is the impact both on the quantity as well as the transcriptional activity of CCC DNA. And there's a really a need um, for standardization of these assays so that um, we know that um, we are able to compare one assay to the other. Uh, as we develop immunotherapy, um, um, we will also need to determine um, if indeed we're stimulating T cell response or B cell response, and if there is a recovery of innate immunity, uh, and we need to know whether these assays work across genotypes um, as well, uh, and um, whether they apply um, across um, the world. And what are the cutoff for which uh, a, a, a stimulation of immune response uh, is going to really result in virus cell clearance? So there are a lot of um, things that we need to address, uh, but very importantly, because current um, treatment is so safe, whatever new treatment that we're going to embark on, uh, we must have similar safety because we cannot have new therapies that might potentially be better uh, in terms of efficacy but cause a safety concern. Uh, and we need to be very careful in determining when a flare is harmful and when a flare is to be expected. Um, this is always a very tricky thing. We certainly know that transient flares may not always be bad, but a severe flare uh, leading to increase in bilirubin um, could be potentially dangerous. And as we develop new treatment, uh, what are the guidelines um, to determine when a drug is um, too dangerous and not allowed to proceed? Um, so there are a lot of um, potentials. But there are also obstacles that we need to overcome. Uh, and um, I think that um, we can, if we all work together, regulatory agencies, um, academia, as well as industry, uh, and as long as we always keep our patients um, in mind, um, because um, this is why we're um, trying to work together. Thank you. <laughs>